One of the things I've been hearing from people a lot is they can't wait to get back to the way things were. But if you've been listening to any of the stuff we've been talking about, uh, my messages, my devotionals, we've been using this time as an opportunity to disguise as an obstacle, an opportunity to consider, to reflect upon maybe some changes we need to make. And so today, I just want to ask this question. Should we really be in a rush to get back to the way things were? I've heard many people saying how they just can't wait to get back to the way things were, but I just thought maybe before we rush back to the way things were, we should just take an honest look at the way they were. Uh, you see, before our thoughts were consumed by what this virus looks like, the symptoms of it, and how we measure freedom, because that's all the conversations I hear, how we measure freedom during this difficult time, well, for most of my lifetime, our thoughts have been consumed by what happiness looks like, and how we measure success, and how we measure meaning. So let's just take an honest look at how most of us were measuring success and meaning in the way things were. Well, we were doing it by possessions, by the houses we lived in, by the cars we drive, the jobs we had, the status that came with it, how hard of a worker we were, the long hours at work, or maybe, maybe that wasn't you. Maybe in your search for meaning and the way things were, you were, well, let's call it the truth, you were idolizing your children. Every night, every weekend was booked, every uh, weekend was booked with an activity, a game, a, a tournament. In fact, I, some people, some of you, and I've been there, some of your vacations were spent screaming at your seven or eight-year-old from a bleacher or courtside or mat side as you spent money that you didn't have to fly your family somewhere your child didn't really want to go to put pressure they didn't need to ensure the cost that you spent by the performance they felt they had to put out. And so Maybe your calendars were booked with gym workouts. Maybe this is you. Maybe the, the children and the jobs and the possessions, but maybe, maybe the way things were, your calendars were booked with gym workouts. This is probably more of, of me at this time in my life that just couldn't be missed. By CrossFit classes, by HIT classes, by spin classes, by morning and evening runs. Maybe your lives, lives were so busy with the pursuit of physical beauty that that you were sacrificing time with your family, that if you didn't get out and didn't have your me time, you just, you had this angst, this lack of joy, this lack of purpose, this lack of meaning. But maybe now that you've spent time with your family, and I hope this is true, perhaps you've realized that that time is valuable and maybe it wasn't worth the trade-off that you were so easily making. You see, regardless of where you fell and the way things were, most all of us were living these ever-increasingly busy lives. But if we're going to be honest, which again, I, I hope we have been the, during this time of, of forced slowing down, that most of us would say that living these insanely busy lives, always in a rush, feeling as if the next purchase is going to be the one, which is crazy because that's what we thought about the last one, idolizing our work as the means to feel validated, living and dying by the achievements of our children, giving them no break in the pressure to perform or, or deriving our self-worth from our physical appearance, I think all of us, all of us, if we look back honestly, would say that it just felt like something was missing. And something was missing. Something is missing. But it's not because you said no to that thing. It's because you said yes to so much other stuff. I, I've said often, and I think it's a, an amazing um, example, natural gas is not in and of itself, it's poisonous. It's not poisonous in and of itself, but what it does is it moves into a space and it pushes out the very thing we need to survive, which is oxygen. And as it does that, as it just pushes out what we need to survive, well, the results are catastrophic. It's death. And it's the same with us. This, the way things were, this life that we had said yes to so many things, well, it just pushed out. It left no space for the things really God said would bring us the abundant life. And so I just thought today, as we begin to re-enter life as it was before, we should just consider saying no to some things or it's going to be just like it was before. The truth of it is we were designed to say yes. We were, we were designed to say yes. And I want you to just consider this. When you love someone, when you first fell in love with your spouse, 
you, you just have this heart of yes for them. You wanted to encourage them. You want to see them grow. You want them to become their very best. As a parent, I have such a heart of yes for my children that I actually sometimes say no to them because I want to leave space in their lives for the things to grow which are going to bring them true happiness and true joy, true meaning. But have you ever been around somebody who has a heart of no towards you? I have. I've been around somebody, people in my life who just have this ever-present no in their hearts for me. They don't want you to feel joy. They love to take shots at you. And I guess what's even harder, and I think we as parents need to consider this for our children, it's even harder to have um, social media in today's age. If someone has a heart of no for you, I can tell you from my example, it's just never ending. Maybe they don't say that I don't like Don, but they will say that that football program or that coach, and I know who they're talking about, and it's just exhausting because you can't escape it. But you know what's even more exhausting than knowing someone has a heart of no for you? What's even more exhausting than someone always taking shots at you and, and making it clear that they have a heart of no toward you? It's even more exhausting just to wonder if someone is for you or if they're against you. And for most all of us, if you've reached a certain age in life, this is a question that you've asked concerning God. It's when I had growing up, I was concerned at many times, is God for me? Is he really? Is he against me? Is he for me? What is God's heart towards me? In fact, I would probably think it would be safe to assume that many of you out there right now, somebody out there, it's a question you're struggling with even today because life hasn't turned out the way that you wanted it to. You just can't seem to catch a break. And so you're asking yourself, man, is God actually for me? Does he have a heart of no for me or yes? And this question was actually answered by the Apostle Paul some 2,000 years ago. And so as you guys know, I love to do history and a backstory. And so let me explain to you Paul's backstory. Paul, when, he's first, uh, when we first find him in Scripture, was actually someone whose entire heart was no against this new faith, followers of the way. And in fact, he had the whole governmental support to track down followers of the way, to squash this thing up to and including death to make sure that this thing did not last. But on one of Paul's journeys, as he he he's heading um, somewhere to do just that, to track down followers of the way, Jesus appears to Saul, Paul. He appears to him, and I can say this as a footnote, I love this, because anytime you come into contact with Jesus, you come out the other side transformed and changed, and that was true of Paul. On the other side of this, Paul becomes the most influential figure in all of Christendom, you could make the case, because he begins to travel all around the Mediterranean region, and he basically is planting these little Jesus franchises in these cities. He goes to all these different cities, and one of the cities that he went to and he planted this Jesus franchise, followers of the way, a community of believers, was the city of Corinth. So Paul writes a letter to the city of Corinth, the believers there, and it's a pretty tough letter. It's a father, it's a, it's a shepherd addressing the people, a father addressing his children on the ways they are messing up, and he doesn't hold back. He doesn't pull any punches. He's very clear with them that this is the way that you are not behaving correctly. And time goes by and he plans to visit them. But just like we've all experienced now, things happen. Plans change and he doesn't make the trip. And so they do what you and I always do in the absence of information. We all do it. We do it in the supermarket when someone doesn't wave back. We do it, um, I've had this when I'm on a run and people will say, man, do we have a problem? Are you, you, is something wrong? I'm like, what are you talking about? And they say, well, I, I, I yelled hello and you didn't respond. And I'm thinking, well, I had headphones in. But, but I do the same thing. When someone I see downtown, I wave and they don't wave back, but I'm sure they saw me. In the absence of information, we connect the dots in the most pathological way. And that's what these believers at Corinth do. When Paul doesn't come back to them after they have that first letter, they begin to question his heart for them. They begin to wonder, does Paul have a heart of no towards us? And so Paul writes them another letter, and this is what he says. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and then to have you send me on my way to Judea. Was I fickle when I intended to do this or do I make my plans in a, a worldly manner? So in the same breath, I say both yes, yes and no, no. no but as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. 
For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. And I want you to, to get this. Don't rush past it because I cannot phrase this enough that this is one of the greatest statements made in the entire course of human history. I'll say it again because if not, you won't get it. I had to consider this, and I know what I'm saying, the weight of what I'm saying, and I'll say it again. I said what I said. This is one of the greatest statements made in the entire course of human history. And why is that? Because Paul is revealing the heart of God towards us. The questions that we have, is God for us? Is God against us? What is his heart towards us? Paul is getting at the very nature of God, and he says this, is he a God of yes for you? Or as we often question, is he instead a finger-wagging, disappointed God of no, like some of us were taught? Some of us unintentionally picked up this idea that God was this finger-wagging, disappointed God of no towards us. And Paul says this, he goes, I don't care how many people in your life have carried a no in their hearts toward you. I don't care, Paul says, if your boss had a heart of no towards you. I don't care if your ex-spouse had a heart of no towards you. I don't care if your parents now, dead and buried all these many years, raise you in the constant awareness of their heart of no towards you. Paul says, I don't care. Every promise God has ever made, he wants to give to you. And in fact, he's saying in this, that Jesus Christ, what we celebrated at, um, we'll celebrate at Christmas, and what we celebrated at Easter and the resurrection, the entire coming down, the entire ministry of Jesus Christ, Paul says, was God's declaration of yes to the world. And Paul is saying in this that once you understand that God carries a heart of yes for you, you know what our lives become? Our lives become yes. It's answered. How does God, the creator of everything, feel about me? It's yes. And Paul is saying that we carry with us this idea that we want more of that. You just begin to want more of that. What do you begin to want more of when you know that God has a heart of yes for you? You want more of the freedom that you now understand. You want more of this sense of lack of condemnation, lack of of, um, needless guilt that you carry around with you when you understand that God has a heart of yes for you. You just want more of that. And so you begin to say no to the things in your life which actually push that awareness out. And like I said earlier, we all get this. We all get that we come into contact with something that is beautiful and magical and amazing and we begin to understand how powerful it is in our life. We just naturally say no to other things. When I fell in love with my wife, suddenly hanging out with my buddies didn't seem as appealing. Saying no to this time I spent with them was easy. It was just natural because I filled in that time with my bride. When I had kids, the same thing happened. When I brought my first son home, when I brought my daughter home, when my third son, my second son, my third child was born and and he became healthy, man, it was not a sacrifice for me to say I wanted to spend time with them. It was natural for me to say I'm just going to I'm going to limit the time I say yes to other stuff because it's getting in the way of what I have in my heart, true value, which is why Paul said this later in Philippians 3.8. He said, more than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. And we get that. We understand that. When I fell in love, I, I understood that. And I've often said I fell in love twice in my life, real love, once with my wife and the other time when I came to understand how much God has a heart of yes for me, I just fell in love. And so I began to push out the things that got in the way of that relationship, and you will too. And what you begin to make space for, and this is the whole point of today, what you begin to make space for when you begin to say no to the things that took up this area of your life, you begin to make space for, well... Well, people, you see, when you experience God's heart of yes towards you, you just naturally want to extend this this goodness to other people. The teachers of the time were threatened by Jesus, and so they would approach him quite often and try to get him um, in a legal conundrum towards the law so they they could prosecute him. And one of the times they came up and they said, out of everything that was ever said 
and all the, the prophets, every law that was given, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said this. He goes, there's two. One is to love God and the other is to love people. And, and this is present throughout all scripture. You see, these two things are so connected. They're, they're so tied together. It is impossible to deconstruct them. And I would say um, it's probably a heartbreak I have quite often when I see people who claim Jesus Christ as their, as their Savior, people who claim to experience God's love. And yet it is so easy for the words that come out of their mouth to be filled with hate for other people whose behaviors or values or beliefs don't mesh up. I, I just don't know how you can deconstruct such a thing. But you see this constantly when you read the accounts of Jesus. You see how he never deconstructed these two things. You see it within the Bible. The bulk of what you read when you're reading about Jesus usually starts off something along the lines of like here, he's walking some beautiful area, he's somewhere, they're heading somewhere, and it says this, as Jesus was walking, or you'll hear this statement, on his way to, you see, that's where the ministry would typically happen. A lot of things you've heard Jesus say, those were not like, um, for me, I love C.S. Lewis, I love another guy named N.T. Wright, um, I go and I find their writings, what they sat down and what they wrote to get the wisdom they have, but that is not how the, the wisdom, the words, the declarations of Jesus came down to us. He was on his way somewhere, and that's where his ministry would typically happen. They were on their way to somewhere when someone would catch his eye and their lives would intersect with his. And actually more than once, the people who were traveling with Jesus his disciples and some of the other in the caravan, it caused them no shortage of exasperation or frustration that while they had an agenda to go somewhere, to be there, Jesus would actually stop when someone's life interrupted their agenda. Because Jesus, through his word and his deeds, he declared that people were never an interruption to his agenda. In fact, and I want you to consider the beauty of this and how heavy it is, the weight of it, people were Jesus's agenda, and so they should be ours. And because of that, I want you to consider this, and this is a huge statement. Because of that, there's no such thing as a neutral encounter with another person. I'll say that again, because we have these throwaways all the time, we think, but because of that, because people were Jesus's agenda, they should be ours, which means there is, there's no such thing as a neutral encounter with another person. All of us in every encounter, we carry a little yes or a little no into every encounter with a person, no matter how brief. At the store, for example, yesterday I'm in this line. In fact, I'll start there. At the store, in the line, every brief encounter you have, you carry a little yes or a no. And this gentleman in front of me, he was babbling on about everything, and I began to feel a little sense of no towards this guy, thinking, man, don't you realize how busy we all are? And then he began to turn to talk to me, and that no grew bigger, and it hit me. I have a heart of no towards him, and I don't want that. And I made the decision in that moment to smile, to listen, because there is no such thing as a neutral encounter with somebody else. At a four-way stop, especially in um, Oregon, when we're both waving each other, no, you go, no, you go, no, you go, and it leads to frustration. There's no such thing as a neutral encounter. At that four-way stop, or maybe on the way out of the Safeway parking lot, when you just want to get home after a long line, and there's that individual over there with his 10 cents matters, will work for food. I'm here to tell you that you have a heart of yes or a heart of no towards that person. I'm not telling you that you should absolutely give them something, but I will say there will be one thing that you're required to give them in just a moment. On my runs through town, it's amazing how many people as I'm running through town wave or honk, like I said earlier. And man, when I hear them or I see them, I try to wave back because I'll never have a neutral encounter with another person. And, and here's the next thing I want you to get. Because people are what's dearest to God's heart, you will never have an encounter with another person that God himself is not interested in. That's powerful. You see, there's no such thing as a neutral encounter. And God is interested in every encounter that we have with anybody because we, as believers, we carry God's heart with us. That's what we say. That's what we believe, that God's heart, his Holy Spirit, indwells within us in such a way that our heart, our thoughts, our behaviors, our emotions, they reflect His. And what is it? 
God has a heart of yes for all of us. So how, if that's true, can we not reflect a heart of yes to the people we encounter? In fact, that's, that's our calling. We are called to be a yes people. But what does that mean in a practical sense? In fact, some of you, when I talked about the guy with the sign, the, the person at the store, you're struggling because you're thinking, well, what are you tell, telling me to do, Don? Am I supposed to do this or that? I'll leave that between you and God, but I will tell you what Paul is saying. See, four times Paul said to greet each other with a holy kiss. Now, don't panic. I'm not saying you should be kissing everybody. In fact, some of you right now are thinking, uh, oh, six feet away is good. In fact, some of you are thinking, social isolation, social isolation, I've been... I've been training for this my whole life. I'm not getting close enough to kiss people, but that's not what Paul is saying. Paul is not saying we should absolutely, with everybody, greet them by a smooch on the lips. But what I do know he is saying is, acknowledge them. I just want to let that sit for a minute. I want you to consider how many times that you rush through your day and people are such an interruption that you can't even acknowledge them. You refuse to make eye contact with them. Paul is saying in this idea of greeting each other with a holy kiss that we should acknowledge each other, that we should greet each other. Acknowledging someone is powerful. I don't underestimate the power of acknowledging someone. You see, stopping and greeting someone is actually this powerful moment when we stop and we invite somebody into our life for just a brief moment. Greeting somebody. It's an expression of your heart's yes towards them. It's a, acknowledging someone that you see, that you encounter, and greeting them. It's a tangible expression. It's a tangible validation to them of their worth to you. And so Paul is saying, be a people who greet one another. Acknowledge them. Acknowledge their worth, their value to God, whose heart you carry within you. And then Paul goes on to say, and, and we can look at verse after verse. So let me just summarize this. Paul says, then what do you do? Well, pretend they're more important. Just pretend that they're more important to you than you. What, what would you do if you were in the presence of somebody who was more important? Well, Paul says, pretend that you always are. In every situation, pretend they're more important. Practice saying things like, well, you first. Or, or how can I help you? Why? Why is this so important? Because we are designed to say yes and if we are not careful, we will say yes to so many things in our busyness and our agendas that it will push out the very thing which we are called to witness to, to minister to, and get back from that, this amazing blessing. And what is that? It's, it's people saying yes to people, to reflect God's love to people. And it may be a little difficult for those of us who have been addicted to our busyness, to our schedules, to our agenda, to basically saying well, what I am. If you knew me, you'd know how important I am. It may be addictive, but so is something else once you begin, once you begin to realize the blessings. Well, greeting people, acknowledging them, stopping and thinking, how can I serve you? It becomes, it becomes addictive. And so what you do is, and I can tell you this from my own personal experience and those people I know, what you do is you begin to look for more opportunities to do it. You just begin to, to look around to think, man, I, I want to do more of this. It's often hard for me when people say to me um, something I did that they go, man, you're just such a good guy. And I'm thinking, you don't know my head. My wife does. My kids do. My friends do. Not a good guy. In fact, what I just did in many ways was selfish because what I know is I get such a rush out of doing things for people that it's actually, it, it's selfish, but in a good way. It's giving myself the best, the blessings that God wants to extend his love to other people. And you know what you become as you begin to look for more opportunities to do that? I'll introduce a word to you that I might have made up, but this is what you become. You become a noticer. You see, when you're looking for opportunities to acknowledge people, to greet people, when you look for opportunities to say you first, to pretend they're more important than you, when you look for opportunities to ask people, how can I serve you? Because it's addictive and what you get back is this peace and this freedom and this contentment. You become a noticer and you know what you notice? I'll just give you some examples. You become a noticer of the single mother struggling in your neighborhood to raise these kids or the elderly couple in your neighborhood who just can't get their own groceries or mow their own yard as a teacher, you become a noticer of the student who's just always tired or always hungry. 
As a coach, you become a noticer of your athletes who never buy food when you stop after a game. You become a noticer of the person at the store in front of you who the line is, is backing up because they're embarrassed. They, they didn't bring enough money on their fixed income for the products and that they're trying to buy. You just become a noticer. And you know what else you become a noticer of? You become a noticer of the people in your own home. You become a noticer of how nobody else in this world ever created can meet the needs that you were designed to meet by your presence and your love and your validation in your own home with your spouse and with your kids. The situations are endless, but maybe you didn't know that. Maybe you didn't know that. Maybe you were missing them because of the way things were. Always in a hurry, always pursuing the things that we said yes to at the expense of those things that we were designed to love, which is people. People who love people are the happiest people I know, and I can never say that without remembering who taught me that, which was Mrs. Barthel. Mrs. Barthel in our fourth grade spring sing, it might have been fifth grade, when we were singing up, up with people, they're the best kind of folks I know. People who love people are the happiest ones I know. But you know what? People who love people because God loves people, man, they're the most joy-filled, joy-filled, contented people I have ever seen. And you know why that is? Because they know that God's promises towards them always carry a yes in Christ. They've asked these questions, and let me just give the ones I've asked and I want you to hear. God, do you actually love me? And the response is yes. God, will you forgive me even again? And he says yes. God, this is a rough time. I don't know if I can get through it. Will you give me the strength? God says yes. Man, I, I've been hurt. God, will you give me the ability to forgive in a situation I can never imagine? And God says, yes, I will. You see, people who understand that God's heart of yes for us is prevalent in every question that we ask when it comes to the blessings, the things we were designed and crave. Well, then they ask the other question. They, they say, well, what is it I need to say no to that I can say yes to the good stuff. Because here's an answer I do not have to say to know what you will respond. Do you want to know that God has a heart for you? Do you want to live in a life where you have contentment and freedom because you know he has no sense of condemnation but nothing but a desire to give you every good gift? Is that the season that you want coming up? So I just want to um, talk about two things. One is just a little order of business, and one is an encouraging and inspirational thing that some of you already know, but I wanted to say it again. The first is, it's really helpful for me, because um, I want to follow the videos and the things we're doing as they come out, to get a notification on my phone. And so one way you can do that is on YouTube, not only do you subscribe, but there'll be a little bell-looking emblem down there, and if you just punch on that, what'll happen is, as soon as the videos drop, both the devotionals and the messages and some of the worship stuff we have coming up, as soon as those drop, you'll get a notification on your phone and you just actually scroll that and you'll find it. And that's just something I thought would be helpful that we wanted to share with you. The second thing is, it fits with what we're talking about today, about living a life where people are your focus. So give me at the most three to five minutes and I'll make it worth your while. I hope it's exciting. A couple weeks ago, someone called me and said, what are you doing for the community and challenged me uh, us at LifePoint to do something tangible for people to be God's hand and feet during this time of kind of a unique, weird situation. So I started to think about it and I'll just give you the end of it. If you want to know how the whole thing worked, go back to the devotional I did this past Tuesday and I'll speak at, at length about it. But where the rubber hit the road was we were able at LifePoint to pay the outstanding water bills for the entire town of Sweet Home for the month of March. And I share that with you so you can share in our excitement. Like I said earlier in the message, this wasn't a situation where we felt, oh no, we have to. It becomes addictive. 
when you realize you can help people and show them love and show them that this is what we think about, about you. I love this town, Sweet Home Oregon. I love this town. We at LifePoint have made it our motto, living faithfully locally. Our three tenets are just what I talked about today. You'll hear them in all our messages probably. Love God, love people, walk in the Spirit. And when we did that, when we loved people, I loved God, and because of that, loved people so much, and the Spirit gave us an opportunity to help people in some tangible way because of the people who do give and support LifePoint, because what you guys do, we were able, I'll say it again because I just get excited and chills, to pay the outstanding water bills for the entire city of Sweet Home for the month of March. So what I would challenge you to do on the back of that and this message today is become a noticer. Notice where God is calling you to minister to somebody. I'll say what I said in the devotion. You may not have the ability right now to pay all the cities anything, but I'll tell you this, I've been shocked at what some of you have done in the past. But I do know that you could do for the one, as Andy Stanley said, what you wish you could do for everyone. And so I hope you guys are inspired. I hope all of this has been an inspiration to you to pick up whatever blessings God has given you and make sure that the blessings God gave you did not cease upon their arrival in your life, but instead they have flowed forth like streams of living water into the community. And so, man, we were excited to be able to do this, but I'm more excited to see what you guys and wherever your deeds touch, how that can multiply for the kingdom. Man, thank you guys so much.